You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-hosts, we interview innovators in the space every week. Ivan, why don't you go ahead and introduce today's guest? Hi, this is Ivan Zak, and I'm introducing Daniel Eisenstadt. Daniel is the CEO and the chairman of the TerraVet Real Estate Solutions, and he's a former president and chairman of the Community Veterinary Partners. He holds an MBA degree from Harvard Business School. On a personal level, previous jobs were corporate lawyer, founder of a toy import business, which I'm very curious about, and founder of an international education-focused non-for-profit organization. So I want to jump in with a sort of question that I experienced myself with the real estate and veterinary medicine. I was trying to buy a clinic recently, and one of the items that we were discussing during the due diligence and negotiation process was the real estate that belonged to a veterinarian. And we were kind of thinking whether, you know, we buy the real estate with the clinic, with the business. So the the notion that the veterinarian or the concept that he was carrying is that that's going to be a passive income. And then, uh, and then for us, we're thinking that it would be an expense. So as we jump into this, can you maybe uh, help me understand in that situation, what is the philosophy? Well, how do people think about when they're selling their clinic? Should they sell their real estate with it? Should they keep it as a passive income? Is it better for seller or buyer? It's a great question. Well, first of all, thanks, guys, for having me on. You know, I think there's a range of different answers to what's best to do for, again, we're talking about now a veterinarian uh, who owns real estate. What's best to do for that veterinarian and in what scenario it makes the most sense for them to either hold the real estate for passive income or consider selling the real estate. One of the major things we often talk to veterinarians about is what percentage of their overall assets that building represents. Because as much as veterinary real estate we think is relatively stable, just like overall the veterinary sector is, and less prone to downturns, it still doesn't make a lot of sense if you're 70 years old to have 50% of your you know, net worth in a single building. You know, there are all sorts of things we all know that happen. And so I think a big piece of the equation here is diversification and risk tolerance and how different people want to think about it. The other thing I, I would say is that often there's a question about who the future owner of that practice is going to be. Is that a corporate group that's going to want to grow and then is going to be looking to the owner of that real estate to put significant additional capital into the real estate to build it out, to expand, to renovate? And, you know, how much does that veterinarian who's now heading potentially towards retirement really want to be involved in that process? And then, you know, third, you know, this also ends up being a function of when do you want liquidity and at what value, right? Uh, real estate tends to, particularly single tenant occupied real estate that is triple net, which is what we're talking about primarily in veterinary real estate, it tends to trade the value of that real estate trades very closely related to the rent and the capitalization rate, which is often tied to interest rates. So if you believe that interest rates are you know, going to go down, and it's hard to see how much more they go down, but they will a little bit, then you might believe that the real estate value is going to go up. If you think that interest rates are going to go up over the next five years, then it's possible that actually the value of your real estate goes down. Um, the other issue is what's the term of your lease? Because um, the shorter term you have on your lease, the less value there is on the real estate. So there is often a belief that real estate is going to continue to increase in value. That's not always true. And so it may be that a veterinarian wants to sell his or her real estate sooner rather than later because they want liquidity at a certain value and there are no assurances that that value will be maintained into the future. So that's probably a long way with a lot of meat to dig into uh, of answering your question, Ivan. It certainly is. And (laughs) from what I understand, if I choose to buy or sell the clinic with or without real estate, I should consult with you. So that's, I heard a lot of variables that you can explain. But with that, it may be a little more simplified terms. When the veterinarians are, are thinking to sell their practice, should they be stuck on this or should they really get a consultancy of the time frame? What is their planning? Is it sort of their ISTIC planning for the long term, where they are in their life cycle, what they expect to do? I think from what I heard, there's all variables and there's no right or wrong answer. I think that's right. I think there's no right or wrong answer, but I think you're spot on that they ought to get advice from 
wealth manager, CPA, lawyer, conciliary, however they want to think about it. Because I think the old school rule of thumb was, oh, you hold on to your real estate, it's good passive income. And that may be the right decision to do. It may also be that the right decision is to sell it for a variety of the reasons that I tried to outline. It also may be that someone wants to hold on to it for a few years, but then plan within a couple of years to sell it thereafter. And in any of those scenarios, I think the the owner of that real estate wants to think about it and have a plan and keep reevaluating the plan because it is, for most veterinarians, after they sell their practice, the building ends up being their largest single asset. And so it's just responsible to just think about it and not to just act as if this is going to always be what it is and to, to just be thoughtful about it. And happy, of course, we're always happy to talk to folks about that. I got a couple things there that I wanted to jump in on. So one is, have you seen the other scenario? So veterinarian owns practice, owns the building, owns the land, and they sell the land, but keep the practice. Is that something you guys ever run into? Terabyte Real Estate right now is about 50 buildings with an aggregate value in excess of $100 million. Um, And we have a dedicated pool of capital of more than $200 million to buy primarily veterinary facilities, veterinary real estate boarding as well. And we have, I can think of three buildings, two in particular, where we actually bought the building and the veterinarians are relatively young and they continue to own the practice. And in those scenarios, it's actually really interesting. They came to us and said, look, and each is a somewhat different scenario, but effectively they're saying we could go and buy the building. We, we could go get a mortgage and we could pull together the down payment and we could, we could do this. But if we do that, we're going to give up some of our dry powder, some of the capital that we have to either live our lives uh, and not be totally stretched, or more importantly, in two of the cases, to be ready to buy an additional practice. So the two scenarios mm-hmm. I'm thinking of, it's a husband-wife veterinarian team. And they're, you know, they're in, in both cases, significantly, you know, uh, under the age of 50, late 30s into their 40s. And they're entrepreneurial and they own, they have bought in both cases a practice that had really, each of these practices had gone down as an older veterinarian hadn't really taken care of it. And these husband and wife teams have come in, bought the practice, and in both scenarios have brought us in to buy the real estate. And in both scenarios have brought us in to buy the real estate with intention of us investing in the physical plant and then increasing rent in accordance with that investment in the real estate. And what they've both said to us is, we know of four or five, six small single doctor practices, or maybe more, within five miles that we would like to own someday. And we're holding on to our dry powder to be able to buy those practices because we think financially, we'll do better buying the practices and ending up with two or three practices than ending up with one practice and the real estate. And yet, what they want is they want a real estate partner, a landlord real estate partner, who in the lease is going to really act like a partner and understand that as they're improving the practice, they want to have someone investing in the building. And so that's literally what we've done in both of those scenarios. In one case, uh, it's a building we've probably put about 300,000 in another case about 50 to 100,000 in and there's a pre-negotiated amount that the rent bumps as we're doing that. So it's been a really interesting scenario. And then the final thing I would just say is I also have seen the situation where veterinarians aren't ready to sell their practice but are really really excited about the fact that all of their friends seem to be selling and getting these big numbers from corporate groups. And where veterinarians are saying, you know, I'm not ready to sell my practice, but I really would like a liquidity event. I want to buy the, you know, the second home. And in those scenarios, there are a couple of people who have come to us looking to sell the real estate while keeping the practice. So you do see some of that. But to be fair, it's the minority of situations we see that. It's more often the case that we see someone selling real estate when they're selling their practice or five years, 10 years after they've sold their practice. That's so cool, Dan. It's it's a really unique approach. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be listeners in the audience uh, that will think to themselves, wow, this, this is an opportunity to maybe increase my quality of life today, but continue to do the same thing that I'm doing. You know, I think of the older veterinarian that's still happy to continue to run the practice for a couple more years, or the younger veterinarian that's sitting on this 
asset that they may not be able to leverage enough dollars to start that second or third practice. And all of a sudden there's this very unique opportunity to be able to expand your business by getting out of the real estate business and focusing on the veterinary business. So very, very interesting, very unique approach. Yeah. It, I mean, we really, we think that there'll be more and more of that happening. I also think I would just emphasize that I, I think the issue around improving the physical plant and the buildings is also one of the drivers, right? Because a lot of times we, we see folks that have bought really good practices, but they've been in inadequate facilities and the cost of the renovation is really, really significant and that they may at times be better off having a, a third party landlord put that money in, but not waiting to do the expansion or renovation of the practice because it may help them with recruiting, retention, just quality of medicine um, and revenue generation. So this issue of building and renovation is, is an issue as well. Man, we've got a friend that I think would love to talk to you. This guy, Joel Parker, he helps consult veterinary practices. And this is such an interesting leverage point for the individual practice owner to compete against corporate. You know, if you see an opportunity, but you, you're cash strapped and you don't have the powder, as you say, to kind of pull the trigger on it, this is a very interesting and unique approach to being able to do business expansion. I think that one of the things we've seen a lot is that veterinarians who are really good at practicing veterinary medicine and are pretty good at running their practice are often a little bit mostly conservative about how quickly they invest in their practice and their building. And part of that has to do with capital constraints, right? This is, it's all coming out of their pocket. And sometimes that conservatism is warranted. And sometimes from a pure business point of view, they would be better off quickly adding another veterinarian, quickly adding an exam room, you know, quickly adding marketing function and the like, because it would make their lives much better. And by the way, the medicine, it would, it would make their, all their stakeholders, their patients, their clients, better off if they did that sooner. But because of the capital constraint, as in it's Dr. Smith's pocket, they don't. And so we view ourselves at TerraVet as very much as a potential partner to any veterinary operator, be they an individual veterinarian or a corporate group, and as a way of extending out that capital. So one of the ways of uh, you know thinking about the real estate in that equation that I, I'm kind of bringing it back to that veterinarian that I thought that you know when you are thinking about selling your practice, which is what situation it then, when veterinarians think about retaining real estate, basically right now if I own it, it is not landing on my P and L, and then I think that uh, my thinking was and the negotiation point where I said okay I'll buy a building. Because basically when you're converting that into your passive income and you're now charging the new business owner, then your P&L, your EBITDA basically is now less the amount of rent you're going to be starting paying. So if you're paying the multiple, then that eats up at a multiple during your acquisition. Is that, is that the right way of thinking about it? Well, it is, but let me sort of add something to it. So I think what, I think what you're saying, Ivan, is that well, let's just say I've been charging my, I own the building and I own the practice and I've been charging myself $100,000 in rent, or I've been charging myself zero in rent, right? However that works. If I charge the new owner of the practice $200,000 in rent, just to keep the math easy, right? Then that's $100,000 of less of earnings for the practice, right? And therefore, the amount that I can sell my practice for is reduced by whatever the 100,000 times, whatever the multiple is, seven, eight, um, so it's a seven hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand dollar decrease in the value of my practice, right? Exactly. Um, that's that's however, the way I was thinking about it. Yep. But here's the however, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. However, in general, real estate trades, uh, single tenant, net lease real estate trades based on cap rates, which are really just inverse multiples. And the multiples of the rent, and it's a little more than rent, it's net operating income, it's the rent minus whatever expenses or reserves are associated with it, but let's for the moment pretend that it's just rent, because it's pretty close. They're very limited. There should be limited reserves if it's a real triple net lease um, and limited expenses. So let's just do the same example. On $100,000 of rent, now going to $200,000, right? the multiple that we we on average have paid is about an 8% capitalization rate, which is a 12 and a half times multiple, right? So 
for that additional hundred thousand dollars in rent, right? We would pay an additional, you know, one point two five million dollars for the real estate, but the reduction of the hundred thousand dollars in EBITDA on the practice would reduce the value of the practice by seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. If in fact the idea is that eventually someone's going to sell their real estate and their practice, they're better off having more rent and lower purchase price for the practice and higher purchase price for the real estate because the total aggregate value that I just gave you in my hypothetical goes up by about a half a million dollars. That is interesting. And it's that scenario. That's one of the things people often don't think about. Veterinarians will often implicitly understand that because what they'll say often is, well, I don't want to sell my real estate because if I'm getting $100,000 in rent, it would take a lot of purchase price for me to replace that cash flow, right? And they're right about that. But that's another way of saying that if someone is a sophisticated buyer of real estate, they should pay a fair amount for that cash flow. Said differently, they should actually be paying in almost all situations more for the cash flow related to the real estate than the cash flow related to the practice. Now, one caveat, the world has gotten crazy, as you guys know, and what groups are paying for practices has gone you know, way up since I started a decade ago in the veterinary world when people were paying five times and six times EBITDA, and now they're paying 10, 11, 12, and for specialty emergency hospitals, sometimes more. So what I just gave as a rule of thumb is just that, a rule of thumb. But it's really worth someone thinking about as they're negotiating their lease at a point that they're selling a practice to make sure that they may really be better off taking a little bit less in the purchase price on the practice, but having a little bit more on the rent because it may long-term lead to more cash flow and then ultimately a greater value on the property. Hmm. Well, then there's a legacy there too. Like if they wanted to give yep. that you know, real estate to uh, their children or whatever, there's all of these different factors and it's uh, really, really absolutely. interesting. The, the other thing is that, that you didn't account into that formula that you, you just outlined is also then the payout that they receive from the real estate, estate sale, then also if they invest that money, right? Because that also then yep. starts generating passive income on, it, on its own, depending on the size of the building and all of that. So that also adds to the entire equation, right? You are absolutely right. The, the, the right way to think about this is whatever they would do with the payout, however they're going to invest the payout net of taxes that they're paying, that creates its own passive income. The other thing that I would just mention about the notion of increasing your rent before you sell uh, your practice, if you're keeping your real estate or if you're looking to sell it at some point in the future, is that it's important to also be aware of what the market rent is because what I just said about being able to get more value for your real estate is generally true as the rent goes up. But if the rent is significantly above market, then the extent to which the multiple on the rent that you get is higher is going to be limited. And and I'll just give you a quick example on this, which is if the market rent in the middle of the country, let's just say, is really 80,000, and there are good ways to determine market rent, which we can talk about if you guys want, and in fact, the veterinarian's been charging 100,000, and he or she then decides in the process of selling the practice and keeping the real estate, they want to bump the rent on their practice to 200000 Even if the buyer of the practice, be they a veterinarian or a corporate group, agrees to that 200000 when a real estate buyer comes along to look at it, they're going to say, whoa, 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 wait a second. This is more than two times market rent, and therefore I am not going to be as excited about paying 12 and a half times Uh, that rent. I may pay 10 times because I'm now worried that I'm way ahead of what the market is and that in the future, if someone were to move this practice or leave, I'm going to be left with a building that I've paid off of a very artificially inflated rent. So one of the other variables to really be aware of is to understand the relationship of the rent being charged and agreed to in the lease to what the market is. So that, that's maybe more in the weeds, but worth understanding. Yeah, I like it. The other thing that I thought of too is taxes, right? You know, if you're going to have an yep. exit event and you're going to sell that corporate, you know, you're selling your building, which is one asset, a completely different asset, and your practice, which is another asset. And to think of them as two separate assets could really Correct. help from a tax planning perspective as well, which is, which is really cool. 
Yeah, the one other thing I would just say on taxes, and there's also something kind of interesting that is possible to do. One of the things we do that I think is unusual for institutional real estate players, and it's because we really view ourselves as part of the veterinary sector, is we have on numerous occasions joint ventured and partnered with veterinarians who are selling their real estate to partner on the building in the future. So Hmm. we might have two veterinarians selling and one wants to take a full liquidity event, the other one wants to keep some ownership in the building. Let's say they want to keep 20%. We're happy to do that, and we've done that a number of times, especially with some of the bigger specialty emergency hospital buildings. What's interesting from a tax point of view there, and again, we're now going a little bit into the weeds, is that when I, as a third-party buyer, buy the real estate, I can go and do a cost segregation study to evaluate the different components of the building you send an engineer in, and I then can basically write up the value of the depreciable parts of the building that allows me to take depreciation on that building and to offset income and to, if you will, defer income, that is the revenue I'm getting from the rent, for a period of years um, so that I may be able to take the rent out of 100000 a year but literally report on my taxes losses because of this depreciation opportunity. Man, Veterinarians who have owned a building for a while can't do that because they've already taken that depreciation. But if they reinvest with us or with anyone and keep 20%, then they can share in that same depreciation shield on the 20% reinvestment. The IRS requires them to actually go through a sale to a third party. So there are some really unusual situations where you can actually – get your cash out, you're going to pay a lump sum potentially of taxes on the cash unless you do a tax-free exchange, more in the weeds. But on the reinvested amount, there are ways to actually defer your taxes if we're able to use depreciation that the veterinarian could not have access. Thanks so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. We're pretty social people, so you'll find us on every social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at the veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening.